everybody. This is Adam Kokesh here with Adam versus the man on the No Force One Studios at the Garden of Freedom with another exciting interview with Stephen McClure, who you might recognize from a few weeks ago. And we interviewed him as a pastor having a, an Easter service in civil disobedience. And it was so beautiful to see really the civil disobedience charge against coronaphobia not led by civil disobedience activists or libertarians or other politicos but just regular christians who wanted to go to church on easter sunday now stephen as a pastor in georgia is all of these things he is a regular american christian who just wants to go to church on easter sunday but he's also a civil disobedience activist a libertarian and a supporter of the Kokesh presidential campaign and an activist with Christians for Kokesh. And Stephen, I, I really I really have to admire this this turn your life has taken. It seems as though you are living in order to create incidents to be interviewed on Adam versus the man, which I, I love. I love it. I, I, I wish all of our volunteers uh, would step up the way that you are. And, and a lot of them are. I don't mean to discredit so many other wonderful efforts. But now we are we are talking to you. Go ahead. Can you send me a list of what I can do to be on the show more? Yeah, right. Uh, dance at the Jefferson Monument, load a shotgun in Washington, D.C., uh, run, run for president on the platform of dissolving the federal government. You know, these, these are things I like to do and talk about. Just, 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 just general guidelines for anybody who might be watching. But no, the, the reason we're interviewing Stephen again is, is not just as a follow-up on the legal situation with what happened with a warrant being issued for his arrest after his incident on Easter, but also the way that he handled it and the way that it came up again in a recent traffic stop. And this isn't just, hey, look at how awesome Adam's volunteers are. Like, you know, look at how awesome libertarian activists are. But even for me, just as a journalist, I don't use the J word on myself a lot here, but as a, as a journalist, you know, who wants to bring my audience a sense in real time of what's going on with coronaphobia, what risks you face with law enforcement right now. I'm really excited about this story. So Steven, you got pulled over with guns in your car, which, which is a very normal thing for you and relatively typical in, in Georgia, of course. But the, you also had to point out to the officers that there was a warrant for your arrest. So first, step back. Tell us about how this warrant came about in the first place, please. Yeah, so Easter Sunday. Um, by the way, it's great to be on the podcast again. It is why I live life. Um, but he, <laughs> Easter Sunday, um, we had informed the sheriff's department, hey, we're doing service. They said no. We said, uh, oh, yes. Uh, so they came on by. And I had about a 45 minute conversation with them. And on three occasions, they said, uh, Mr. McClure, we're going to need you to disperse the uh, the congregation here. And on three occasions, I said, no. Um, and well, I, that, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, I just have there, there's one thing that, that you said in there already that deserves being underscored. They didn't tell you. Hey, we're here. We're the law. We're responsible. We are going to disperse your congregation doing illegal things. Yeah. They said, Stephen, we need you to be deputized as law enforcement and you go do the dirty work for us and you tell Christians they can't have an Easter service. That's actually a felony here in Georgia. If a cop tries to go into a church without authorization of the pastors, it's a felony. Uh, <laughs> there has to be an active violent crime being committed at the time. Wait, isn't isn't it violent if you're if you're standing within six feet of someone and you might be giving them Corona? They haven't used that as an excuse to. All right, whatever. So, so I don't know if we've got over this yet, but the charge of disturbing the peace. Now, here's the deal. Um, we were being peaceful, and they due to the guns came up, breaking orders. That's where the peace was disturbed. Of so, course. but whatever. Um, so yeah. It's three charges of disturbing the peace under the guides of, on three occasions, I said no. Mm. That's, wow. That's, that is, I mean, whoo. That, that is the, 
that is a, 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 a among the dumbest of arrests out there. That for standing there and saying no, you got a, a, a disturbing the peace. And and it 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 does the does the charge say anything more specific relating to hosting a service? Distur the exact charge is disturbing the peace, nonviolent, no, um, non uh, non aggressive. Okay. So Interesting. Said, if you if you cuss at an officer in the state of Georgia, you're being aggressive. So if I said <laughs> F no, that would have been disturbing the peace aggressively. Um, if I smacked a chair on the ground, that would have been um, violently. Uh, yeah, violent. <laughs> but because I said no, it's just disturbing the peace. So did they, they, they issued you citations then and there? No. So if you remember the story, the last thing that we said to each other was, hey, I hope you come back. And the youngest officer turned around and said, maybe I will with a warrant. Um, <laughs> so he got a warrant, but then he never came back. Okay. So um, the warrant, <clears throat> the, did the, the, with the warrant, he had, he had issued citations in order to justify the warrant then? Yes. Yeah. And, but they you weren't can, issued. He, he just wrote them because, I mean, my understanding and, you know, different legalities, different areas, different states of emergency, in order for a misdemeanor citation to be valid, they either have to actually physically detain you and process you and book you or write you a ticket that you sign where you are released in your own recognizance. But yeah, I guess I, now they're able to just write citations, even not in your presence, in order to get a warrant. So full disclosure, um, I've got a few lawyers looking into it and they don't think this will make it to court because of, of issues. Course not. Yeah. Yeah. This is no, and, and it is worth pointing out as part of our coverage of how things have shifted during Corona phobia to educate people on just the basics of how police work and how that has shifted. And Regardless of whether it's a legitimate charge or not, police can arrest you and police have the legal protection, the leeway to falsely arrest you in order to carry out the whims of politicians, regardless of whether it's legal or not, because they can do so. They can arrest you illegally, detain you, take you in, book you. You get released on bond later that day or the next day. And even if it's an unlawful arrest, you can't really sue them. It's very, very difficult to sue a police officer. And oftentimes they will arrest you because they don't like you to get you off the street. And I've actually had in uh, in Texas an attorney, a district attorney, tell me, well, you can beat the charges, but you can't beat the ride. And that's a sad state of the police state in America where police can detain, arrest, detain, take you away at least for a short period of time where they have no consequences and they need essentially no excuse. And now under Corona phobia, they have more excuses. Yeah. But even in Georgia, you can't sue a police officer. You can sue the right. private person of a police officer, but you can't sue that private person for his conduct as a police officer. So he so can break. You got pulled over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's uh, every, I, I just, the bottom line here for people to know is that you know you only call cops when you absolutely when absolutely have when every last option has been expended and even then you have to be extremely careful and especially right now like generally speaking I avoid cops you know I mean I, when when there's a reason to I'll talk to them I'll confront them when I'm at a protest and they're hanging out maybe I'll have some fun with them but every police interaction is a liability. It's a risk. It's a danger to you. And right now, with this accountability removed, police are somewhere around five to ten times more dangerous than they normally are. And and that that is significant. So yeah, th maybe not stay at home, but stay away from cops, especially during the coronaphobia crisis when their mechanism of accountability isn't as active. I just shared a story from the Washington Times about courts being shut down. Criminals get arrested and don't have fair trials, don't have a speedy trial, none of the due process that is shut down because of coronaphobia that's supposed to protect your rights is in place right now, and cops know that. So, Stephen, you got pulled over. This is the follow-up story. Yep. Uh, how many days later? Um, I got pulled over three weeks later, um, and the officer's walking over the car. I roll the window down. I turn the engine off. I go, hey, just so you know, as he's walking up, he's not even to the uh, back seat yet. I go, there's multiple guns in the car. 
Um, and he goes, all right, here's the deal on that. You pull your gun, I pull my gun. I said, cool. Don't pull your gun, I won't pull my gun. Um, <laughs> nice. And uh, he goes, hey, I need your license. I said, all right. I hand him my license. And I go, hey. And as I'm handing it to him and I hold it, I go, kind of know I'm being stopped because you cut me off back there. And I was like, oh, I didn't even see you. He goes, that's how you cut me off. I'm like, all right. <laughs> He, uh, he goes back to his car, sits there for a minute, and as he's uh, doing his thing, multiple cars are pulling up, and I figure, oh, okay. He's a little antsy because there's it's not it's not a pistol. It's a pistol, and yes, I am that redneck. It's a pistol and a <laughs> all the time. Nice. Um, nice. And I, I understand that can be a little scary for people. Um, so... He comes back to the car, and all the officers are getting out, and they're all kind of walking towards me. Um, and I'm like, okay, something's up. He goes, hey, I need you out of the car. I said, are you asking or telling? He goes, I am telling. Uh, mm. And I go, okay, can I know why? He goes, as soon as you're out, I'll tell you. I said, okay. Um, I said, am I opening the door? You open the door. So he opens the door, um, and then I unlock it. Then he actually opens it. Um, and he goes, hey, you have multiple warrants for your arrest, and we got to figure out what's going on. And I said, I don't have warrants for my arrest. I, I haven't had warrants for my arrest in years. He goes, mm. you're free right now. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> so his lieutenant comes up and says, hey, you need to put him in handcuffs now because you're calling guns and all this stuff. So if you're not aware, you can get handcuffed one of two ways. You can handcuff like this in front or in back. And this is right. way more comfortable. So if you of have course. the option, if you know you're getting handcuffed, like there's eight guys up here, just throw your <laughs> hands up. And just save yourself some back pain for a minute. Um, yeah, so they, don't make they, them push you up against the car. <laughs> yeah. So um, they they go, hey, is there anything you, we need about in the car? And I said, um, you don't have my right. To, you don't have my permission to search my vehicle. And they said, well, actually, we have probable cause at this point. I said, OK, here's what you're going to find. Here's where you're going to find it. Just be advised. And uh, he goes, are the guns loaded? And I said, I don't carry paperweights around. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So they kind of laughed at that. And here's where things get funny. In Georgia, if you have a bandana, you're considered a gang member. So that's my yeah. uh, gang affiliation. I am the uh, the purple <laughs> unicorn gang, homie. Uh, yeah, that happened. That fucking happened. Um, but as they're searching the car and they find the weed and they find the stuff and um, they're searching and they go, hey, you have three misdemeanor warrants. And they start telling me what it's for. And I'm like, and I look at the officer. I go, was that was that Easter? And he goes, Yeah. And I go, Oh, okay. I see what's going on here. Um, and I tell them what happened. And the lieutenant looks at me and goes, There's no way. I was like, Lieutenant, whatever. Just all right. Let's go to jail. And he goes, Well, our jail can't take you. Said, what? Do you what? He goes, Our jail can't take you because you're not high risk enough. And I said, What do you mean? You're not violent. You're not. You're not a runner. And I said, so what does that mean? He goes, well, we got to find out what Jasper wants to do. Jasper County is the agency that filed the warrant. Um, so Jasper County gets called and they said, hey, they're rejecting him. I'm not considered high risk enough. And I said, and so I get to talk with officers and one of them walks up and he, uh, he puts this in my face and he goes, what's this? And I said, um, <laughs> And I said, do me a favor. He said, what's that? I said, make sure you have clean hands because those things are expensive. And I like to keep them yep. clean. And he goes, but where'd you get this? And I said, um, see the circle? He goes, yeah. I said, look on the back of the circle. Um, and it says Afghanistan. I said, uh, that's where I got that at. And uh, immediately I got unhandcuffed. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, oh. Immediately, I get unhandcuffed. Um, mm. And we keep talking, and what's happened is. Hold so on, I, let's go, go back. For people who are listening who don't get to watch the visual, you had a metal rack with three medals. One, I believe, is your Afghanistan campaign ribbon. One is a purple heart, and one is a bronze star. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. The, the proper order of that, if you want to be super, super squared away, is bronze star, purple heart, Afghan campaign ribbon. I, oh, I was reading it backwards because you pointed out the... Oh, yes, you're correct. Yeah. <laughs> some, some dude that's never served is like, what are they doing? <laughs> but they're in seniority ribbons and stuff. But uh, they unhandcuffed me, 
and they're looking at all the weed and stuff and they're like hey how do we know the difference between cbd and weed and i said the cbd is labeled as cbd and the weed is just weed it's not in a cbd <laughs> container and they said okay that's cool they start measuring everything out and i'm like wait i'm a handcuffed and they're what's going on here so no, hold on just I, oh, I gotta go back just one thing you had both cannabis and cbd products in the vehicle yes now the CBD, I understand, is totally legal in Georgia. Is that correct? It's totally legal in Georgia. However, comma, if it's if there's questions about whether it's actually weed or if it's CBD, they do have the ability to take you in, process and it, test it. Oh, just oh my god, that's insane! But you also had THC cannabis, yeah, as well, and that is you have no legal justification for that as a patient or any other exemption in I Georgia. Mean, I the patient, but say the Georgia doesn't recognize cannabis as like right. Marijuana. Okay, so you, so for for you for you small possession in Georgia is at least a misdemeanor. Yeah. Also, right. Okay. And you admitted to that right when you told them what was in the vehicle. You said there's yeah. guns and weed and CBD, and it's all there and there and there. Here's the deal: CBD is not a big deal, but if you lie about it, it's a right. it's a felony with a minimum of one year incarceration. You have to go yeah. to prison. If you sell CBD or if you sell weed as CBD or CBD as weed, you're automatically no questions asked going to prison, not jail, prison. Okay, so they uncuff you and they're talking about your weed and CBD now. Yeah, and they start to ask me why and I explain to them, and I'm going to just throw this out there. Um, if you've done things or if things have been done to you and you're having to deal with PTSD, don't be ashamed of it. Go talk to people that know what to do. And if that course is weed, smoke a little bit of weed. You know, obviously, I don't smoke weed at work because I, I work with metal presses and I don't want to lose my fingers to a metal press because I'm not paying attention or <laughs> my reflexes are messed up. But, man, like, if you need help, you can use nature as medicine. Amen. Yeah, so... Going back to the actual traffic stop, they're, they're measuring the weed out and they're making catalogs. And this guy walks up to me with his hands in a bulletproof vest with like the magazines and stuff and goes, are you repping a gang? And I said, uh, I said not currently. And he goes, what's that supposed to mean? I was like, dude, look at me. I'm 135 pounds white boy. You think I hold up in prison too well? Like, come on. <laughs> and uh, he goes, no, seriously, you have gang paraphernalia in the car. And I go, what gang paraphernalia? And he goes, your bandana was next to your pistol. So my hands are on handcuffed, and I go, sir, look at me. What is gangsterific about this? <laughs> Rainbows and unicorns on a bandana, and they take that as an excuse. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Is this terrifying uh, for you now? Oh, like, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the oh man, waving the gun with the, the the purple bandana, yeah, you're you're from the purple unicorn gang, sure. Okay, no, but okay, so they're they're, they're obviously at this point no street tax, no street tax. <laughs> so at this point, they're obviously just trying to to you know get you to say something that could escalate it, that could justify taking you in and standing around going is there anything here and fortunately you're with us today because because so the lieutenant walks up to me and goes hey so here's the deal ja jasper county can't take you we can't take you um and if i cite you on any of the items i have to take them and we can't take them without taking <laughs> And I, said, I said, so what does that mean? And like, I started to smile because you know exactly what that means. So they, they yanked the bolt out of the, out of the AR and they put all the pieces in the seat right. where they found it. Right. And then they put the weed on the hood of the car, the CBD back where it belongs. They unload the pistol and they put everything on the driver's seat. And he said, here's the deal. If you touch any of that while my guys are in this parking lot, I assume you're a deadly threat. And I said, but what does that mean? He says, we're leaving now. And I said, what do you do with my guns? He goes, they're in the car. I said, what car? They said, he said, your car. I said, what are you doing with my CBD? He goes, it's in, it's in the car. I said, my car? He says, yes. I said, and, and I go, and the, 
and the weed? He goes, John, I'm putting your car. I'm not putting it back in. There. Now, now, this is this is all like I, I there is there's one like beautiful surprising note of compassion in this in this bigger hilarious scenario is that if they were like really concerned about weed as a threat like if weed was like crocodile or you know some other you know drug you do and it just kills you right away something or you kill other people <laughs> you look like a gangster now <laughs> then they would have they would have destroyed the weed right like how easy would it uh, are we going to take your bag of weed we're going to dump it on the ground we're going to you know this is illegal we're going to but no what here here this, this, what, what's really interesting here with that weed itself, that they didn't destroy it, that they gave it back to you knowing that it was illegal. Because it's one thing for them to say, hey, we can't enforce stuff, but we're going to stop this. We're, we're not going to contribute to this illegal. We, you, you, I, I have weed in my hand that hypothetically is yours, but it's illegal for you to possess. It's illegal for me to possess, except as evidence in my professional capacity. I can't do it as this. The responsible thing to do would be to destroy the weed. Yeah. But because they didn't destroy the weed, they are now accessories to your crime of cannabis possession. And I would bet in, in Georgia, they, they probably forgot some other thing they could have charged you with. Because I would bet that there is another provision in Georgia state law that says if you have a controlled substance with a firearm at the same time in your possession, that that's a felony. Am I, do you know anything about that? That is completely true, but here's the deal. Right now, police don't have one of their big resources. One of their, The biggest resource a police officer has is the red button on his radio. So, like, if he does something really stupid and now he's getting the crap kicked out, press that red button and everybody comes. The other resource he has is the jail. But they have to they have to be really selective who they let in the jail right now because of coronaphobia. Right? So, in a way, coronavirus is the reason I've got these charges. But in a way, it's the reason that I'm on the podcast right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, and part of me is like, those cops should get fired for being too nice as cops, you know, like, it, but it, it, they were also obviously doing the typical police, you know, harassment, try to get you on a charge kind of traffic stop. Were any of them practicing social distancing? Um, some of them were, but I don't know if it was on purpose. Like, obviously, when right. I got handcuffed, it wasn't. And when he put the bandana in my face, he wasn't. But, like, there were some officers that were, like, searching the car. But I don't know if they were searching the car or if they were practicing social distancing while searching the car. Um, but the, the place that I want to talk about this for a moment. So I live in Newton County. I'm starting an affiliate in for Rockdale, Newton, and Walton. So what I did was I wanted to know what the facts are. So I called, I called the county that filed the arrest warrant. They refused to take me, right? So I currently have three outstanding warrants for my arrest. And it's just a matter of time, which is a really sketchy place to be in. But anyways, I called the three jails in my area and I said, hey, you know, can you verify this is happening? And they said, yes, sir, we can. Rockdale County Jail, they have 250 four-man cells. Um, and they can only put one man in a cell. So they can only have 250. They can't have anyone outside right now. So that cuts down on their capacity. So the maximum capacity is 250. Well, when all this went down, it, it wasn't a trickle effect. It was a mass exodus of nonviolent drug offenders and nonviolent offenders in general. They got released from Rockdale. Same with Walton County. Same with Rockdale County. I've talked to the heads of the police of the of the uh, jails. And, you know, I'm being told by captains and, and majors here that, you yeah, we made a decision within three or four hours apiece. Like, just get these people out of here. So I, I'm trying to have conversations with my local law enforcement leaders of if it's not that big of a deal with coronaphobia, can we move into, let's say, 2021, 2030 with some common sense and say, dude, like, you know that this is against the law. So here's what we're going to do. Here's your yellow paper. Come to court. We can talk about it then. But we're also going to treat like a human and not put you in a cage. Yeah. No, this is a great 
teaching moment for America. Hey, remember that time when cops stopped enforcing victimless crime laws and the sky didn't fall? Remember how things got better on that count all around? This is going to be a critical story. And, and Stephen, I'm glad that your personal story is so powerfully interwoven with this. And I, and I hope we get to interview you again, you know, maybe in a few weeks when you've got the next legal update or if you have a chance to uh, address these warrants. But the fact that you, on the scene of a traffic stop, uh, you beat a bunch of felony charges and a misdemeanor and had a cop give you your weed back. I mean, that's that's crazy. Like, I I know, yes, huge victory, epic victory. And I, I, I ironically, I have a little bit of a similar story for Counterpoint here at uh, Checkpoint in Arizona with Border Patrol. And this was about 10 years ago where I had guns and weed. And because it was a Border Patrol checkpoint, local cops didn't want to come out and pull me out, you know, pull me in for uh, p minor weed possession. They gave me the guns back, but not the weed. So 10 years later, thanks to coronaphobia, Stephen's got to one up me here. But this is really a, a beautiful story. And I think that there are a lot of important lessons here for the audience in terms of the legal reality of coronaphobia now that is with us and is going to be with us for a while, even with shutdowns and lockdowns being lifted, the threat that is being uh, you know, blown up, artificially recognized, at least by government in terms of the threat with jails and with cops is making it very difficult for them to prosecute petty stuff. Now, I don't want to uh, certainly, you know, encourage anybody to take risks that they wouldn't need to, that there's no benefit from. I wouldn't say, you know, go out and play with fire, but know that the fire is a little less harmful right now. If that changes your risk calculations, yeah, uh, adjust accordingly. And more importantly for us long term, looking politically at this situation, there's a huge opportunity. And speaking of that, Christians for Kokesh, combining this civil disobedience sentiment that currently exists among Christians. I don't think Christians in America, and someone's probably going to give me a better historical example here, but except from early American history, at least in modern American history, I don't think Christians have ever had this distinct a psychological separation from government, where government is the enemy of religion, of their religion, of your religion as a Christian. Yes, government is using fear, not reasonable distancing or security precautions, but using fear to prevent you from exercising your religious rights. And Christians right now, still overall, more than drug dealers, you know, more than pimps and hoes, Christians are the tip of the spear in civil disobedience. And Stephen, you, you told me earlier that you and our director of Christians for Kokesh, Zach Parks, who, by the way, was the officiant at our Mad Max wedding the day before yesterday here at the Garden of Freedom. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, beautiful event. You got, wait, till, wait till you see what Zach was wearing. <laughs> we're, we're getting that video out later today. Uh, but, but Stephen, you guys are doing a Christians for Kokesh podcast. Now, I, I hope also that, uh, you know, maybe libertarian Christians, that, that you, you give yourself uh, a means of transitioning this effort into something long term that's viable with or without me. Of course, I'm deeply honored that you guys see as I do this campaign, uh, turning the federal election into a referendum on whether the federal government should be allowed to exist at all as the tip of the spear for freedom right now. So tell us a little bit about what you and Zach are, are putting together with this new podcast. So Zach and I are getting together and we are doing a podcast. He lives in Texas. I live in Georgia. So we're going to Skype it in. So it's going to be a similar setup to this. But um, no, we're going to go through the Bible and figure out how christians and how politics are to meet together um because there's a there's a lot of opinions but as christians what me and him believe is this thing called sola scriptoris only scripture scripture first so we want to see what scripture has to say about our political beliefs and we want to show people we want to defend our actions with the bible so if you want to have an argument with jesus that's on you but don't come to me and tell me how I'm waking. <laughs> but, uh, oh, that's beautiful. No, I, I, I gotta say, this is to the to the cliche of, I, I love your Christ, not so much your Christians. Yes, there, there is, a, there is a very powerful mythology in Christianity 
that, uh, as a matter of faith, a lot of people take as absolute truth that helps them live better lives. And there are still a lot of people in the Christian community in the United States who are genuine, well-intentioned commun- uh, individuals who abuse Christianity, who use it to excuse unchristian actions, who use it as an excuse to be worse people. And I, I think most relevant right now in the political climate is the worship of false idols. And I think with, with Christianity as an important component of it, there is a, a, a spiritual awakening on the horizon as relates to society and the, the, the global human family and governments in particular, where the worship of the state, the worship of politicians, the worship of Cheeto Jesus and every other personality cult in politics is falling apart. And, and, and some people will, some Christians will correctly point out that it is a fall from faith of society that leaves us vulnerable to politicians taking the place of spiritual leadership in society. And as someone who is very distinctly not a Christian, I can say that that it is that those Christians have a very good point, and I think they are correct. It's not necessarily a fall from Christianity. As, as, as some of you know, I, I'm certainly more of an open source rather than doctrinaire spiritualist, if you will, more of a, a Buddhist and pantheist. And I think that even in that realm, a lot of people who say, well, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual, they're not really spiritual either. And a lot of them are statists. They still worship the state. They still worship the Democrats or the, I think in that camp, it's more the Democrats, but you know, but they still worship the state. They still worship authority. They still worship personalities. And I would rather see, I would rather live in a country with a healthy Christian spirituality that recognizes that God comes above government, that, that, that you do not worship false idols rather than a, a community that you know, rejects Christianity but worships the state as a false idol. And I think the proper course of, of human progress in this realm right now is for America to re-embrace a kind of spirituality that is directly contradictory as it should be to the false idols of government and government authority. And if Christians are leading the way in that, then I will support y'all wholeheartedly and call you my brothers fighting this fight to displace the false idols of government. So Stephen, thank you so much for everything that you do in this effort. Any, any last thoughts about any of this? So there are two things I want to say and then I'll be done. Um, I really want to encourage the audience to call your local sheriff, find out how many people they released, find out what they're doing, and then challenge them to carry that on. After we are done with coronaphobia, um, whatever that means, maybe our law enforcement can continue the actions of not arresting everybody that steps on a crack in the sidewalk. So <laughs> that's, that's my big challenge to you all today is push forward. Atlanta, Atlanta is about to close down their jail permanently. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And I want to see that for Phoenix. I want to see that for Covington. I want to see that for everywhere. Um, and I want to see I want to see your viewers be the spearhead on that. So that's number one. Number two, do not pay to be enslaved. I'm done. Don't pay to be enslaved, guys. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Stephen. And as we develop this production, obviously, you're seeing it right now. A new and improved version of Adam versus the Man with our producer CJ Abernathy behind us, which means that I have more time to develop the, these campaigns around uh, all the various efforts that we've had in the past. And if you see someone who is, uh, you know, organizing some effort to push back in your area, join it, do it for, for this whole time. We've been encouraging people to protest in their own way. It's great to see it's bearing fruit. If it comes to that point where you have the opportunity in your community to say, right here, close this jail, shut down these policies, do it, push forward 100%. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to uh, talking to you again in, in a few weeks with a follow-up. And mwah, peace and love, y'all.
Christmas. <laughs>